Excuse me, my dog. Hi, guys. Well, it is a gray, gloomy winter day in early October as we have gone from, what, 85 on Thursday to about 45 <coughs> today. But somehow we have stumbled into a Sunday. It is Sunday, October 8th, 2023. Uh, so being Sunday, I think we need to check in with a Doomer that we have never heard from on Collapse Chronicles. As far as I know, I have never done a Doomsday Sermon, Doomsday Sunday Sermon from none other than Pope Francis. Uh, <laughs> so I guess it's time to change that. You know, Pope Francis, I'm not a big fan of popes or the Catholic Church. Uh, you know, anybody with a brain knows that the Catholic Church probably with the maybe now is in second position behind the U.S. military as the single most bloodthirsty, ecocidal, omnicidal, planet-killing, human-enslaving uh, a bunch of evil mongers in the history of the world. And uh, I, they just, I've just always thought of all of these uh, creepy old men uh, in, in the Catholic Church as just a bunch of creepy old pedophile child molesters. It's the biggest bunch of, uh, uh, of creepy child molesters this side of, I don't know, the Boy Scouts of America or the Baptist Church. Uh, I, I don't understand why anybody gives a shit uh, what the Pope uh, has to say uh, uh, about a goddamn thing. Uh, it, it, it's always been a complete mystery to me. I'm a little bit encouraged that there seems to be some sign that more and more people are abandoning the uh, Catholic Church, as they should. Uh, that's the only encouraging sign I see about the Catholic Church. But you know, as popes go, this guy's pretty good. I, you know, I remember when he became overnight my hero. Remember when the Pope was first uh, elected or or set up there by whoever the the jar shakers are that stick the Pope at the top of the, uh, 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 of the jar. Uh, so he, he comes in there, I think what he'd been in power for a couple of weeks and made that comment about how uh, Catholics do not need to breed like rabbits. <laughs> and such, suddenly Pope Francis was my hero and then a couple of days later, naturally, the, uh, uh, the, the people who, uh, in the shadows, who put him uh, where he is, uh, made him come out and apologize for making the single most honest statement in Catholic Church history. But anyway, then I guess a few years ago, he wrote one of these... Uh, they use the word encyclicals, talking about the, the Pope giving his ideas on how to save the planet. So I guess Pope Francis has updated his uh, Doomer message to the world and uh, been getting a good bit of press in the mainstream media who, you know, who cherry pick two or three sentences out of this long, involved thing. And uh, so I'm going to do a little more than that. We're going to, uh, I'm probably going to read about a fourth of the, the Pope's new message of doom uh, to the world. And I'll put the link. You can read the rest of it. But uh, these are the parts. And and, and, and I'm going to try to stay out of it because, you know, let's give the man a break. 
Okay, imagine what this drooling old fart is up against. Uh, good lord, the fact that he even got this out is, is, is unbelievable. Now, do keep in mind, guys, that the Pope is not the one who wrote this. Okay, who knows who really wrote it. And a lot of what I'm going to be reading are quotes from other writers that there's a lot of footnotes. I'm not going to break up the narrative flow. I'm just going to make it one narrative flow. And you can go in, uh, into the footnotes and go on to all these links that he's referencing. I'm just going to just, I'm just going to mash it up and pretend like it really was the Pope who wrote this, but whoever in the Catholic Church wrote this, you know, good for them. <coughs> so take it away. Supposedly, Pope Francis, again, I'm just picking and choosing. <coughs> Eight years have passed since I published the encyclical letter when I wanted to share with all of you, my brothers and sisters of our suffering planet, my heartfelt concerns about the care of our common home. Yet, with the passage of time, I have realized that our responses have not been adequate while the world in which we live is collapsing, all right, a chronicler of the collapse himself, Pope the chronicler of the collapse, while the world in which we live is collapsing and may be nearing the breaking point. In addition to this possibility, it is indisputable, indisputable that the impact of climate change will increasingly prejudice the lives and families of many persons. We will feel its effects in the areas of health care, source of, sources of employment, access to resources, housing, forced migration, etc. This is a global issue and one intimately related to the dignity of human life. The bishops of the United States have expressed very well this social meaning of our concern about climate change, which goes beyond a merely, a merely ecological approach because our care for one another and our care for the earth are intimately bound together. Climate change is one of the principal challenges facing society and the global community. <clears throat> um, and then we're going to see, he kind of summarizes the global climate crisis. Uh, which I, I think we know pretty well uh, and then talking a lot about climate uh, change deniers and uh, I anyway don't have time to insult but we're going to jump ahead to verse 11 of his new encyclical <clears throat> It is no longer possible to doubt the human anthropic origin of climate change. Let us see why. The concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which causes global warming, was stable until the 19th century, below 300 parts per million in volume, but in the middle of that century, in conjunction with industrial development, emissions began to increase. Now, he does not, of course, mention the, also the population hockey stick that you, that you see along with emissions. 
uh, increase. No mention of the uh, of the population hockey stick. It goes to it goes without saying. Um, in the past fifty years, this increase has accelerated significantly as the Mauna Loa Observatory which has taken daily measurements of carbon dioxide since 1958 has confirmed. While I was writing, you know, his last one of these uh, back in 2015, they hit a historic high 400 parts per million until arriving at 423 parts per million in June of this year. More than 42% of total net emissions since the year 1850 were produced after 1990. And he has all of these uh, sources, you know, footnoted and referenced. At the same time, we have confirmed that in the last 50 years, the temperature has risen at an unprecedented speed, greater than at any time over the past 2,000 years. In this period, the trend what was that warming of 0.15 C per decade, double that of the last 150 years. From 1850 on, the global temperature has risen by 1.1 C, with even greater impact on the polar regions. At this rate, it is possible that in just 10 years, we will reach the recommended maximum global ceiling of 1.5 C. This increase has not occurred on the Earth's surface alone, but also several kilometers higher in the atmosphere, on the surface of the oceans, and even in their depths for hundreds of miles. Thus, the acidification of the seas increased, and their oxygen levels were reduced. The glaciers are receding, the snow cover is diminishing, and the sea level is constantly rising. It is not possible to conceal the correlation of these global climate phenomena and the accelerated increase in greenhouse gas emissions, particularly since the mid-20th century. The overwhelming majority of scientists specializing in the climate support this correlation and only a very small percentage of them seek to deny the evidence. <clears throat> Regrettably, the climate crisis is not exactly a matter that interests the great economic powers, whose concern is with the greatest profit possible at minimal cost and in the shortest amount of time. <clears throat> I feel obliged to make these clarifications, which may appear obvious because of certain dismissive and scarcely reasonable opinions that I encounter even within the Catholic Church. Yet we can no longer doubt that the reason for the unusual rapidity of these dangerous changes is a fact that cannot be concealed. The enormous novelties that have to do with unchecked human intervention on nature in the past two centuries. Events of natural origin that usually cause warming, such as volcanic eruptions and others, are insufficient to explain the proportion and speed of the change of recent decades, the change in average surface temperatures cannot be explained as the result of, it cannot be explained except as the result of the increase of greenhouse gases. 
some effects of climate of the climate crisis are already irreversible at least for several hundred years, such as the increase in the global temperature of the oceans, their acidification, and the decrease of oxygen. Ocean waters have a thermal inertia, inertia and centuries are needed to normalize their temperature and salinity, which affects the survival of many species. This is one of the many signs that the other creatures of the world have stopped being our companions along the way and have become instead our victims. The same can be said about the decrease in the continental ice sheets. The melting of the poles will not be able to be reversed for hundreds of years. As for the climate, there are factors that have persisted over long periods of time independent of the events that may have triggered them. For this reason, we are now unable to halt the enormous damage we have caused. We barely have time to prevent even more tragic damage. Certain apocalyptic diagnoses may well appear scarcely reasonable or insufficiently grounded. This should not lead us to ignore the real possibility that we are approaching a critical point. Small changes can cause greater ones unforeseen and perhaps already irreversible due to factors of inertia. This would end up precipitating a cascade of events having a snowball effect. In such cases, it is always too late since no intervention will be able to halt a process once begun. There is no turning back. We cannot state with certainty that all of this is going to happen based on present conditions, but it is certain that it continues to be a possibility if we take into account phenomena already in motion that sensitize the climate like the reduction of ice sheets, changes in ocean currents, deforestation in tropical rainforest, and the melting of permafrost in Russia, etc. Consequently, a broader perspective is urgently needed, one that can enable us to esteem the marvels of progress but also to pay serious attention to other effects that were probably unimaginable a century ago. What is being asked of us is nothing other than a certain responsibility for the legacy we will leave behind once we pass from this world. And now, uh, he heads into book two, a growing technocratic paradigm. We're going to read verses 20 through 32. Uh, through 33. We're going to read the pretty much the book of a growing technocratic paradigm pretty much the whole book, verses 20 to 33. You know, back in his last one of these things, I offered a brief resume of the technocratic paradigm underlying the current process of environmental decay. It is a certain way of understanding human life and activity that has gone awry to the serious detriment of the world around us. Deep down, it, 
it consists in thinking as if reality, goodness, and truth automatically flow from technological and economic power as such. As a logical consequence, it then becomes easy to accept the idea of infinite or unlimited growth, which proves so attractive to economists, financiers, and experts in technology. In recent years, we have been able to confirm this diagnosis, even as we have witnessed a new advance of the above paradigm. Artificial intelligence and the latest technological innovations start with the notion of a human being with no limits, whose abilities and possibilities can be infinitely expanded thanks to technology. In this way, the technocratic paradigm monstrously feeds upon itself. Without a doubt, the natural resources required by technology, such as lithium, silicon, and so many others, are not unlimited, yet the greater problem is the ideology underlying an obsession to increase human power beyond anything imaginable, before which non-human reality is a mere resource at its, meaning humanity's, disposal. Everything that exists ceases to be a gift for which we should be thankful, esteem, and cherish, and instead becomes a slave prey to any whim of the human mind and its capacities. It is chilling to realize that the capacities expanded by technology have given those with the knowledge and especially the economic resources to use them an impressive dominance over the whole of humanity and the entire world. Never has humanity had such power over itself, yet nothing ensures that it will be used wisely, particularly when we consider how it is currently being used. In whose hands does all this power lie, or will it eventually end up? It is extremely risky for a small part of humanity to have it. So now the Pope uh, asks us to rethink our use of power in verses 24 to 33. <clears throat> Not every increase in power represents progress for humanity. We need only think of the admirable technologies that were employed to decimate populations, drop atomic bombs, and annihilate ethnic groups. There were historical moments where our admiration at progress blinded us to the horror of its consequences, but that risk is always present because our immense technological development has not been accompanied by a development in human responsibility, values, and conscience. We stand naked and exposed in the face of our ever increasing power, lacking the wherewithal to control it. We have certain superficial mechanisms, but we cannot claim to have a sound ethics, a culture, and spirituality genuinely capable of setting limits and teaching clear-minded self-restraint. 
it is not strange that so great a power in such hands is capable of destroying life while the mentality proper to the technocratic paradigm blinds us and does not permit us to see this extremely grave problem of present-day humanity. <clears throat> Contrary to this technocratic paradigm, we say that the world that surrounds us is not, we say, meaning whoever we, the Pope and who, uh, and, you know, the guys above him, we say that the world that surrounds us is not an object of exploitation. There you go. The Catholic Church says that the world that surrounds us is not an object of exploitation, unbridled use, and unlimited ambition. I'm I'm sure Christopher Columbus, uh, who we will be celebrating tomorrow, is certainly the torchbearer of that uh, hilarious statement from uh, the biggest, uh, you know, exploiters and users of unlimited ambition in the history of the world. Anyway, but I said I wasn't going to do this. Nor can we claim that nature is a mere setting in which we develop our lives and our projects, for we are part of nature, included in it, and thus in constant interaction with it. Where is this? Uh... Where was I? This itself exclude, this itself excludes the idea that the human being is extraneous. Anyway, I'm not going to say, he goes off on a little, uh, obviously, uh, he goes off on some of his human primacy stuff. Uh, I'm gonna, so I'm going to skip over. He gets a little lost uh, in his human primacy. So let's see. Let's get back on track, Daddy Pope. The great present day problem is that the technocratic paradigm has destroyed that healthy and harmonious relationship. In any event, the indispensable need to move beyond that paradigm so damaging and destructive will not be found in a denial of the human being, but include the interaction of natural systems with social systems. We need to rethink among other things, the question of human power, its meaning, and its limits. For our power has frenetically increased in a few decades. We have made impressive and awesome technological advances, and we have not realized that at the same time, we have turned into highly dangerous beings capable of threatening the lives of many beings and our own survival. Today, it is worth repeating the ironic comment of Solovyov about an age which was so advanced as to be actually the last one. We need lucidity and honesty in order to recognize in time that our power and the progress we are producing are turning against us. So what is the ethical Goad. I don't think that's a typo. 
the ethical decadence of real power is disguised thanks to marketing and false information. Useful tools in the hands of those with greater resources to employ them to shape public opinion. With the help of these means, whenever plans are made to undertake a project involving significant changes in the environment or high levels of can contamination, one raises the uh, raises the uh, raises the ho uh, uh, hopes of the people of that area by speaking of the local progress that it will be able to generate or the potential of economic growth, enjoyment, and human promotion that it would mean for their children. Yet, in reality, there does not seem to be any true interest in the future of these people since they are not clearly told that the project will result in the clearing of their lands, a decline in the quality of their lives, a desolate and less habitable landscape lacking in life, the joy of community, and huh, and huh, and huh, and huh, and hope for the future, in addition to the global damage that eventually compromises many other people as well. <clears throat> and then he uh, zeroes in uh, talking about nuclear waste disposal. Uh, just to give an example of what he's talking about, this situation has to has to do not only with physics or biology, but also with the economy and the way we conceive it. The mentality of maximum gain at minimal cost, disguised in terms of reasonableness, progress, and illusory promises makes impossible any sincere for any sincere concern for our common home and any real preoccupation about assisting the poor and the needy discarded by our society. In recent years, we can note that astounded and excited by the promises of any number of false prophets, the poor themselves at time fall prey to the illusion of a world that is not being built for them. Once again, I love the leader of the Catholic Church talking about the promises of false prophets. Yes, and the poor themselves falling prey to the illusion of a world that is not being built for them. Thank you, Pope Francis, for that knee slapper. Mistaken notions also develop about the concept of meritocracy, which becomes seen as a merited human power to which everything must be submitted under the rule of those born with greater possibilities and advantages. A healthy approach to the value of hard work, the development of one's native abilities, and praiseworthy spirit of initiative is one thing, but if one does not seek a genuine equality of opportunity, meritocracy can easily become a screen that further consolidates the privileges of a few with great power. In this perverse logic, 
why should they care about the damage done to our common home if they feel securely shielded by the financial resources that they have earned by their abilities and effort? In conscience and with an eye to the children who will pay for their harm done by their actions, the question of meaning inevitably arises, what is the meaning of my life? What is the meaning of my time on this earth? And what is the ultimate meaning of all my work and effort? And then he goes off from there and uh, gets into the joke of the all of these former climate meetings and uh, the one coming up. And then he wraps up. He has to bring some God stuff into it. Uh, as my preacher at my wedding told me, he, he, he goes, Sam, I'm a preacher. I'm going to have to bring a little bit of the God stuff in into your wedding. Uh, my preacher was apologizing while I was renting a hotel room for him and his girlfriend at the Cleveland Motel in the middle of the Georgia Bible Belt. <laughs> Oh, the God stuff. But anyway, guys, all joking aside, you know, good, good, good for Pope Francis. So get out there and enjoy the, uh, whether you call it the Columbus Day weekend or the Noble Savage Day weekend. While you still can, I gotta turn my heater back on. Bye, guys.